Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us um, for our September 21st, 2022 facilitated discussion or webinar with the Harm Reduction Nurses Association. The topic today is on over medicalization, harm reduction, nursing, allyship, co optation with and power presented by Corey Ranger and Karen Ward. And I'll introduce them in a little bit. My name is Megan Brown. I am um, the secretary on the board of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association, and we host webinars monthly to bi-monthly, and we are posting these on YouTube, so they're being recorded right now. Um, excited to have Karen and Corey here today. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that where I am um, is on the unceded and stolen lands of the Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples, um, also known today in uh, for Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees nations, and the um, Wasanich nations here in Saanich, north of Victoria. We at HRNA do work with individuals and organizations across all of Turtle Island and honor the life force of indigenous peoples that have had their land stolen and who continue to resist ongoing genocide. Addressing the root causes of the toxic drug of the toxic drug supply is inextricably linked and connected to decolonization. Also, of course, would like to acknowledge today that the content discussed today and all of the work that we do is, of course, made possible by people with lived and living experience of drug use, sharing their knowledge and experience without their generosity um, and all of their work in terms of uh, all of the groundwork and grassroots organizing that has occurred in history, um, harm reduction initiatives would not exist. Okay, so Karen and Corey. So these are some of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. Karen is against math deaths and works to reduce the harms of public policy by imagining different ones, also yeah. gifts. And drugs are good, actually. Corey Ranger is a registered nurse and president of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association. Corey is a nurse educator at the BCCDC and is regularly involved in provincial and national advocacy to address toxic drug policy. I already introduced myself a little bit earlier, but like I said, I'm Megan Brown. Um, happy to be facilitating here today. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'm going to get started and you can hear me all right. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, an important precursor today is that we want to do some education, but more so uh, we'd like to be able to leave nurses and other attendees and other people who are going to watch the recording later uh, with some tangible steps that they can take in order to show solidarity, support each other, advocate more effectively. As we progress through today's content, you will find yourself challenged and maybe even a bit uncomfortable, and that's okay. Uh, we're here to share our experiences and learnings, but not to suggest we are the authority on the topic. We want to promote discussion, understanding, and share perspectives. We want questions, and we also want people to be able to reflect on their own practice and values. This is a new format for Karen and I and for the HRNA, and so we are not scripted, and we may not even agree at times, but that's actually part of the experience. Yeah. Today's lecture looks a little bit like this. We're going to uh, go through a little bit of a quick preamble, a bit of a framing exercise. It's a rapid fire primer, uh, and the concepts all tie into each other at the end. Uh, we want to talk about what happens when our values and principles become compromised over time and what is the impact of prolonged moral distress. Talk about power dynamics, the power dynamics that exist within nursing in the context of unregulated drug poisonings, and how can nurses navigate these dynamics for better outcomes. Uh, and then we're going to have a facilitated discussion afterwards where uh, Megan's going to ask questions to Karen and myself, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for attendees to ask questions as well. So I'm gonna go through a quick framing exercise. And these definitions are from folks like the Harm Reduction International uh, and the component on indigenous harm reduction is from the First Nations Health Authority. It's intended to prompt questions and even disagreement. Uh, and, and I suspect it will among those who are listening. 
Uh, so the definition of harm reduction from Harm Reduction International is that harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. Harm reduction is grounded in justice and human rights. It focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that they stop using drugs. Now, I'd like you to take a moment to think about what that means and what that means to you and understand that a superficial comprehension of harm reduction means you view it in terms of a series of services, like needle distribution or naloxone programming. But if you understand yeah. that these services are simply the how of harm reduction, and as you zoom out, you understand that harm reduction is a guiding philosophy of practice and a means to inform public policy. It's an approach rather than, yeah, it's an approach rather than a list of things or a, or a, like it's not a, it's, it's not con concrete, it's not, it's dynamic as harm is, and it must, it changes in context, right? It changes all the time. And that's part of the thing that we're, we're I think we're failing to grasp here in, in, in a lot of ways. Oh, in the big sense, in the big sense. I mean, and people, you, can, you know. And you can look at harm reduction from a public health perspective too. And from that regard, it's about reducing risk. And that also is a pretty superficial look at what, what harm reduction really is. But if you keep zooming out, you can see that harm reduction is part of a rights-based movement. And it's centered on agency of choice and bodily autonomy. And in this regards, we're a little bit further upstream and actually looking at what the root causes are of these harms. Here's where we start to understand that drugs are not inherently dangerous, but we make them dangerous through prohibitive policy. Right. It's not, yeah, it's not the drugs, it's the drug policy that's killing people. It's, um, and that goes way, way back, drug policy, drug prohibition being a, a fundamental structure of, of the, you know, of the nation state um, and our historical moment. Absolutely. And if you take a different approach and even understand that there are other ways of looking at harm reduction and you look at definitions mm -hmm. that come from indigenous organizations, you'll look that harm, you'll understand that harm reduction often doesn't refer to drugs at all, but oh, rather yeah. the goal of harm reduction is to reduce the harms of colonization, the harms of prohibition, the harms of other oppressive laws and an unregulated toxic and volatile drug supply is an output of those different factors. Yeah. That's true. It's a consequence rather than a, than a cause. Is the um, the thing too is like if you think about it as an approach, then harm reduction in effect is a way of making space to actually build new structures, um, because you're you're I mean, it's very much the case that is that you're being kind of crushed by by the by by structural violence is and that's how it's when you see that that's how people are dying it's, it's a kind of it's the um, the old old definition of, of social murder right it's the the system that we live in leaves leaves um, isn't actually killing you, but it it leaves you no no other option though but to die, right? So it's it's a it's a way it's a way of it's a mode of resistance, um, in a in a uh, as a practice in a, in that sense, and, and because it's creative as well, you're always finding new ways. To, you're always being able to adapt to a to a particular context in a particular dynamic situation. And. What we also know is that harm reduction is informed by principles, but first and foremost, those principles are based on a shared set of values. And so yeah. typically people working in harm reduction share these common set of values, and those are what eventually inform the principles in which uh, we practice and the ways, the philosophies in which we practice harm reduction. And mm -hmm. a quick overview of these principles uh, from, this is from Harm Reduction International, the National Coalition of Harm Reduction, and these principles are uh, intended to be a precursor to the facilitated discussion, but yeah. most people are familiar with them. The first is that drug use is a human behavior that many people across the world are unwilling or unable to stop. See, I don't like that one because it's negative. It's, drug use is a human behavior. It's like making, people use drugs like they make art, you know, or make, or, or, or you know, it's not a it's not something that you're un, not able to do it's something that you do absolutely there's some there's some poor framing in that one i agree okay. yeah the next is that people who use drugs do not lose their human rights due to their drug use mm. the third is that people use drugs for many different reasons and in many different ways the fourth is that harm reduction is evidence-based 
And the fifth is that harm reduction is committed to meeting people where they're at. That's a common uh, trope in harm reduction uh, statement, but yeah. it's, you know, when you look at it a little bit more deeply, it's not meant, meant to be, uh, you know, literally meeting people where they're at, but it's about person-centered approaches to, to care and making sure that people have their goals uplifted and their priorities uplifted. Consent and information and, yeah, and, and yeah, definitely, it's good. You should read that sometime in some of the, yeah, some of the institutional more ways of doing that. The sixth is that options for prevention, care, and treatment must be evidence-based, accessible, and non-coercive. <laughs> the seventh is that people who use or use drugs must be involved in designing, implementing, and evaluating programs and policies that serve them. And the final two is that harm reduction is rooted in a commitment to social justice and that harm reduction challenges policies and practices that cause harm. So we have these principles uh, and that's that's wonderful. And everyone's pretty familiar with those principles. I'm glad we went through that exercise to begin. But this is where my slide animation skills will wow you all because here on the left side of this graph, we have nursing ethics. And your nursing ethics are also guided by underlining principles that are informed by a set of values, just like the principles of harm reduction. But sometimes nursing ethics are out of alignment with the realities of the situations that we face. And in order to navigate these ethical dilemmas, as we call them, nurses are provided ethical decision-making tools. And these tools act for a guidepost on how you gather information, analyze perspectives, seek support, and ultimately land on a decision. But the truth is that these tools are very impractical, they're checkboxes, and they're actually tools for the people in power. The reality is that nobody working as a nurse has the time to thoroughly use an ethical decision-making tool. And if you're wrong, you'll be told that you use the tool wrong. And moreover, having a tool is a way for those in power to offload accountability on the individual nurse. And then we have experiences where what we do falls outside of what we can do, falls outside of what we should do, uh, and it leads to some moral distress. And so we have this principles of harm reduction where there's an overlap and uh, the reason why I talk about this is because a lot of nurses have experienced the moral distress and the moral residue that comes from knowing what you should do, but not feeling like you have the ability to do that. And my my first experience of that is working as a nurse in an acute care setting uh, and having to sneak in uh, uh, harm reduction supplies for the person to be able to use their drugs. It, what we knew was right was for people to have access to sterile supplies and policy dictated that you were not allowed to do so. And so there you find when you of uh, your nursing ethics and your policies and principles that you're actually starting to experience some moral drift. Mm. So the principles of harm reduction represent more of a realistic guidepost that unfortunately many of us in healthcare profession feel uh, has an assumption of risk associated with it. Uh, and oftentimes nurses feel uh, powerless when it comes to doing what they believe to be true and correct. Mm -hmm. And so then we find ourselves in the middle here and how we actually find ways to make changes within institutions that cause harm uh, is that we work together and that harm reduction at its core is a redistribution of power and resources to those who don't have it. And so as nurses, we have a responsibility to still find ways to navigate these ethical dilemmas, even when it, it falls outside of what we would believe to be our scope or what is institutional policy. Mm. And sometimes you won't actually be able to make the change that you need. Uh, individuals often experience, uh, have poor experiences in hospitals, even despite your best efforts. Uh, and maybe this might even happen a lot. You find yourself that you're in a moral drift and what you believe to be right is not reflected in how you work. It creates distress and discomfort over time and elicits stress and anxiety. And over that time, that feeling can become chronic. It's like you have a bit of an identity crisis with what you're doing at work versus how you actually want to act. So what could we do to avoid this? Oh, that's good. What we can do to avoid this is to understand that this is bigger than us. And who else can help drive change? How can we work together? How do we organize? How do we coordinate our efforts? Uh, and hopefully, as we move through into the discussion portion, we'll be able to talk about strategies that nurses can take uh, so that they can promote change within their workplace, even if it feels as though there is an over uh, 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 insurmountable power dynamic. Yes. 
And lastly, before we get into the discussion, uh, we also have to explore the power dynamics that exist within nursing. And when you do this, you can understand and help mobilize power and privilege so that you can help foster change. Nurses do have power and they do have privilege. And it's important to understand how that power impacts others for better or worse. One of the most powerful tools in your advocacy toolkit is your presence. You're around a lot and you see a lot and your patients or your clients tell you a lot. So a nurse as witness is a vital role because people who use drugs, people who face harms at the hands of the medical system need to be trusted and have their voices heard. Simply being present and listening is an important act of, of allyship. There are times though, when power imbalance is so one-sided <laughs> that it doesn't feel like you can get past it. And you either find yourself sliding into moral distress or accruing that moral residue over time. Mm. And then there comes times when there are people who have even more power than that. And I particularly use this term stakeholders knowing the colonial mm. roots of that term because it's often people who are not directly affected by what's happening to patients or, or clients or the people that we work with, but who have vested interests that do not align with the work that we do. Right. And then yeah. we have the patient who exists on this spectrum and is the person who has the least amount of power. And so it's important as nurses that we understand what power we have and how we can mobilize it so that we can be better allies. So we're moving into the part about the discussion now. And so I'm gonna pass some of yeah. this over to Karen and we're gonna talk about co-optation and over-medicalization. Uh, and so Karen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to you, okay? Yeah, I want to just I want to start from where you left off, actually, and talk a little bit more about power. And, and the one thing you didn't mention there is about how to build power. And as, as like just say from your perspective there, from your position, I should say, as a nurse, if you're finding that you've got you've got someone on the far end of the scale there, excess power, as you say, how do you and you're you're experiencing distress? And there's a lot of there's your your the, the people that you're that you're um, you're caring for are suffering, uh, you know, are massively getting, you know, suffering their kind of violence and justice. How do you build power to overcome that? Where you where do you um, where do you start? And that's the thing because I see this a lot where everyone's been people have been very well, very capable of being of advocating for themselves or as a, as an individual. But we but there's this thing about there's the the power that we need to build is across first of all across that power that power that, that arrow. That you've drawn, and uh, among and horizontally as well, right? So there's power with 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 um, with with more people, more nurses, let's say. But there's also the power when you do the real allyship, when you do the work of say, you know, documenting things that are happening uh, to, to the to to um, to your patients, because the, the experience that is it's so it's so dramatic. The the, the it was called is a. a, a Epistemological injustice, where what a, what a person who uses drugs says is happening to them. This is my experience. They're simply they're just, just dismissed. They're not believed. They're completely silenced. They, they, no, that doesn't matter what happens to you, really. And they have nowhere to go. They have nowhere, no one to listen to them in any meaningful way. So that that becomes what? How do you how do you actually build power in such a situation? What's your what? What can you do with your privilege? It's not merely just to say, well. We can, we'll just, we'll, we can, we'll go tell them and, and we'll deal with this. But it's actually about, um, you know, finding out, like helping the resources are all about knowledge. In fact, it's all, it's all about who do you tell, who do you talk to, how do I write this, how do I document this? When they say, for example, let's say you're, let's say you're at your, at your, uh, at your, um, your clinic and you've got situations with police outside. How do you address that? The, the um, people are, I find that even now, people are, healthcare professionals, constantly astonished by the, by the power of, of, of policing um, and don't know how to address that. And, and that's where we need to build those, 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 those not, just, not just allyships, but real coalitions, actually more like conspirators, if you like, to really um, keep each other safe, but also learn from each other because there's expertise that we, there's multiple kinds of expertise here at play. And, and um, I think that that's where, first of all, we get to break power down. We get to break the hierarchy down because we, we can recognize, we, again, we take a hard reduction. We recognize that 
if I can recognize where you're at, your situation in an, in a uh, in a, in a healthcare setting of, as a professional, you recognize where I'm at, for example, as a patient within the, within these various uh, constricted um, you know uh, sets of um, sets of um, how can I say of access, let's say. Then where do we? How do we mix? How do we match those up to actually increase our power? Right. This is a it's a very complicated thing, and it's different from each situation, but. You would combine it's those co combinations, people with extensive knowledge of policing, people with experience of police, direct experience of police violence, plus the healthcare professional. How can we put these together? That's a very, very powerful combination. And we don't get there, we don't get there enough because there's there's the, the, the barrier tends to tends to be um tends to be political in a very, I mean in a very um specific way, which is to say, how do we actually, what are our tactics? What is our strategy? And what is our purpose? What is our goal? We, we need to kind of, we need to break that down and start at the beginning. What is our purpose? What is our drug policy? What is the, what is our, what is our goal here? And I think that those ten, those things tend to be left on, left as if, as if we assume that we're there, but we don't need to, we don't, we left, we leave them unsaid. And that's, um, that's something we need to actually try to articulate because it's, it, it changes and it's complicated. And we need to, and it's actually a more of a trust building exercise in many ways because we need to make sure that we're actually, you know, running to the same end. Um, in that sense, if we're not, that's where co-optation happens, is that moment right there. If, you're, if your purposes are not aligned in a very, you know, in, in a, just in an honest way, how can we be, we can't be working together some, someone is being co-opted. Someone is being exploited and used. And, we, and when we're in a situation where people have so little power, that happens an awful lot. And it's very, it's because it's very, very. I mean, it, it, it. And I see it a lot here in the you know downtown east side because you know because people are people are very desperate. And people are very poor, and people are just are are literally dying to be heard. And uh, so there's 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 exploitation in that sense is rife. Um, how. And I think that um, that's where, you know, I think I want to pause for a second, but I think this is where, you know, these are the things we need to start to, to talk about uh, out loud. We have, to, we have to take our assumptions, recognize them as such, and just talk about them right there, articulate it. What, are, what is our purpose? What is our goal? What are we actually, what's our message actually in all of this? Where are we going right now? If we can't see those things, then, then yeah, we do have some very, um troubling power dynamics that are being uh that are being um you know well exploited that are being uh leveraged for one person for one for one one's gain rather than all of our you know hopes as it were um, and we're not clearly you know clearly if we're not we're clearly we're not we're not saying all these things out loud we're not getting we're not in the right direction and we don't seem to recognize the extent the, ex the sheer extent of the of the power, the many forms of power that we're facing, um, you know, it's it's, and that make and that of course is also makes sense because you don't have to face that the extent of that power when you've got enough privilege to be able to avoid it. So, um, I want to throw that back to you for a second because I I got I want to think for a second about how how we the the direct the very specific way how do we build those alliances how do we build the trust. When we've also got the thing, you know, as you know well, we've also got uh, people with experience of, uh, of, uh, of, of medical violence, for example, medical trauma. Uh, how do we build that? How do we build across that to really create a coalition that works, a conspiracy that works? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for putting it that way. And I will just carry on with, with what you've said uh, and, and add to the fact that uh, co-optation, uh, as you said, you, you can tell that moment when, when co-optation happens, but co-optation can also happen from an individual level or an organizational yeah. level. You can see that drift in principles and identity happen over time, and it even happens on a societal level as well, oh, yeah. uh, because it, it, it arises from the way um, politicians and people in power frame the debate. It arises from the language that we use. It arises from laws that continue to be upheld. 
Uh, and it also happens when funding priorities start to override what uh, what an organization is in initially intended to be doing. Uh, and we see that happen time and time again. And that's that arises. Yeah, yeah go on. Um, oh, sorry. I was going to add, I just, oops, oops, what did I do? I was going, to, did I get there? Am I here? Yeah. Okay. I was going to add the idea that we see that I'm seeing a lot is there's a, well, first of all, we have the thing where organizations and stuff like that, they always are, they have, well, this is what the funding is for. Well, there's only this much funding. And then it turns into the fighting for scraps thing. Then you've got, you see the thing where it's, uh, oops, what did I, okay. then you see the thing where it's um, elite capture, right? Where think about, for example, think about pilot projects, right? You know, since these are another, this is, a, this is a form of elite capture. Well, you're the best and you'll do this. And it's a way of keeping you busy as well. You're doing the work you wanted, or at least a version of it, but you're also, you know, but you've also got your, now you're dependent on the same sort of funding. I mean, that's the thing we see again here. You know, that's how, that's how VCH runs the neighborhood, you know, it's by funding through, con through service contracts and, and, uh, and picking up, picking, pick, picking who, and who is, who is doing what and being able to, you know, hold that, you know, hold that, um, you know, hold that, that, that sword over their, over one's head. Because there's because it's because we're in a situation of austerity and poverty, and you don't want to get cut because you need to serve your people. Why am I here? Well, I'm doing this. Well, is that what they wanted? Well, we don't know, but we had to get some contract. I mean, this is a very it's a very, you know, and that's and that's again. I mean, that's 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 part of um, that's part of what this that's part of what we're dealing with. But again, like I keep like I always say, this is a these are not this is not inevitable or natural. Or, 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 or permanent. Like this is, these are choices. These are all policy choices, and they're, they are, were, and are intended to have these kinds of effects. And this, and they're, you know, they're, you know, thoroughly political. And this is a part of this too is an exertion of power. So if you, if you um, like, so that is a very much, a, you know, the, the opposite of freedom, and that's intended. And that's the, that's the that's the that that's why you know you you can't go break. You can't go you know just start your own you know, thing in the middle of, you can't do that because you won't get funding, you know, and that's, but then these people will die. And that's what it comes right down to at this point, because that's, that's who we're, we're, we're in many senses, you know, and, and you know this well, we're, we're, um, we're constrained in a very, in a very, very, um, like the, the constraints upon us are what allow people to continue doing their work. And uh, so it becomes this double bind where, People could talk all they like about 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 you know you know justice and, and this and that and revolution and la la la, but you've actually got to you've actually got very very tight boundaries by putting yourself through the through the very modes that you're allowed to do anything. So so and that's you know some people call that neoliberalism, but it's actually the, it's very much what we're experiencing too is very much about a about the um it's a, it's a kind of the it's the bigger version or the or the actually it's the acceptable version let's put it this way it's the acceptable version of what people are experiencing on the street when they're buying drugs when they're living on when they're living on when they're hot doing the, on the hustle when they're on the grind right i mean i refer to this again and again it's like this is the future what we're seeing what we see in the downtown east side is unregulated survival capitalism on stolen land and it is the future for everyone else and that's becoming more and more evident i think every day as we kind of plunge head first into this, you know, this, this, uh, these, colli these colliding crises, which is actually the same crisis. There's no possible way that this is going to simply end on its own. None of this will. And that's, and at least on those, in a one, well, and in some sense, I hope that we're getting to the point where we can recognize that we're not, nobody is this, we're not spectators of this, right? We are participants. We're part of, we are, you know, we all, we are, we are in history. We're not watching it to happen to some, some, someone else. And that's where, that's where the, you know, and that, and that's, you know, that's very much again about about recognizing one's role is as an agent, as a political agent, as someone who can do things, as someone who can make significant change. So let's be like, and then bring back there because that's something that people don't realize nearly often enough. People just tend to go to work or they just tend to get up and go do their thing. And we need to recognize that we have far more power than we that we um, than we are than we are told to believe wow, that was incredibly powerful thank you um yeah. and we also get co-opted uh through other ways uh we get co-opted co through accepting bite-sized morsels from government oh, yeah. through the means of incrementalism 
uh, and, and being made to compromise quite often. And we can see that in a number of policy decisions where we understand that the, say, Controlled Drugs and Substances Act in its entirety is flawed. It's racist. It's built upon colonial grounds. Uh, and when we ask for help to stop the, the rising tide of drug poisoning deaths, we're allowed to set up tiny little spaces where people can use drugs mm -hmm. and have their overdoses reversed if they overdose, uh, but we're not actually ad addressing the root cause. Uh, yeah. And there again comes another opportunity for co-option. Yes, we have to get an exemption from this terrible law, but in doing so, we allow the law to, to you know, reinscribe itself. We start to, it starts to, be, and I've seen this again and again in policy discussions, where it's like the law itself is like, it seems to be understood as unchangeable and permanent. And it's like, no, actually people make the law. You know, we just, we're also like, people are, people are also us. It's just a human construct. And we actually need to start thinking that we, we get exemptions only show that it's, that it's, that it's unjust. And that needs to be our, that needs to be not just our, our long-term goal, we need to say that every time we send this day of law, we send the law and take it apart because it's not actually controlling drugs in any way at all. Um, and I think there's, there's the absurdity, there's this profound absurdity in drug policy that, that, we, that we, gotta, we have to hammer away at. I mean, watching, I don't know if you saw last, uh, last night, if you had a chance to, Corey, but the, uh, but the speech at the, at the UN by the president of Colombia saying this stuff, saying that if you want to actually save if you want to deal with the climate, you need to you need to end prohibition. You need to end the war on drugs. That's important. And you need to if you want to actually survive the world, you need to end the war on drugs. That is where we're at. And that are the, those are the kinds of things that we need to say. We can't say, well, I'd like an exemption from one section of this one part. I mean, we need to actually be bold because other look, look, look what we're doing. Look what this. I mean, we can't actually. We're not going to survive this. It is not going to get any better until we start thinking about bigger steps. So I think that, I think that, um, yeah, pilot projects like, deliberately. The other thing I talked about with this is the intentional policy fail, right? If you say, well, we'll do this one thing, you can have your five projects, your safety supply projects, but then we'll evaluate and see how it goes. Actually, you know, it's not going to address, five pilot projects in a province is not, are not going to address the actual illicit supply. They will save, you know, a few hundred people. They will not address the trajectory of the emergency. They cannot. There's an intentional policy fail by design. So we've got to watch that sort of thing. I mean, the other thing I was going to just quickly say is that we've got this idea. Well, why that's not going to help? Why isn't the government the government that they know that's not going to help us? Why do we think that the government's trying to help anybody? Where do we get this idea? We I mean we have assumed that we all have the same goal. Well, we want to help drug users. But then they, they didn't say that. They never, they, uh, their, their goals are not ours. The goals of governments are not the goals of people, of, of people, you know, people here, of us, of anyone. Their goal, the, the goals of many governments is simply to be the next, the next government. Um, and the, and, uh, and to, like, the goal of power is to maintain power. And to do so, they must maintain the status quo. That's the opposite of us, of ours. They're, they're not, you know, they, it's not about, like, wanting to, wanting to do this. This is not a small thing. What we're trying to do we're trying to actually say make structural change and that is something that is exactly what what you know certainly this one certainly this provincial government certainly our federal government that is exactly what they don't want so we need to you know stop get to stop nipping at corners and, and say this is not and this is not again it's not about drug users this is about a better future and it's for everybody and you know except for the police but whatever but i mean it's, it's for all of us it's a better world it's not just so that somebody can get their, get, you know, it's, it's the, for the future. And what we must get to the point of recognizing that it's a big change and that we, and we have much more in common with the public that's demanding big change too. We're not alone. I couldn't have said it better myself. We're gonna move now into the facilitated discussion component of uh, today's session, and which means I'm gonna pass things back over to Megan. 
Thanks, Corey and Karen. That was great. Um, so we're going to start with asking Corey and Karen some question, pre prepared questions. And later on, um, if you have ideas about questions that are coming up for you dur during the discussion, I know I have a couple. Um, we can ask Corey and Karen those as well, and they can kind of just riff back and forth on those. So, Corey, we'll just look at the first question here. Yeah, so you have both kind of talked touched on the subject of framing and kind of how um, issues related to drug use and policy um, advocacy are discussed uh, in the public sphere. Why is framing important to understand in this context of public policy and advocacy? Okay, well, it's, it's super important because we have a hundred, we've had a hundred, hundred plus years of the, of, of uh, this entire narrative being told by, um, first of all, by government by, and by their agents, by, by, you know, by, by police. A lot of, I don't know if this is, this is um, well understood, but the, you know how that the police are the ones it, like talking to governments, municipal governments, to, to like, you know, to health authorities. They're talking, they're, in, they're to media constantly about what this is, constantly. They have massive community, like they are, they are like, think of it this way. They're telling the story and we're always reacting to it. And that's the, that is a huge problem because we need to start telling our story of what this, what is happening. I mean, the police, you know, and, and that's, and then we can actually move it forward because people don't, People are getting this completely nonsensical, distorted version of it because it's police, or police through somebody else, through this somebody else, and it's not. Um, it, first of all, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, real. It's not. Um, it doesn't comprehend the the, the the weight of it, and it doesn't under. It, it's certainly not from the point of view of anybody who is uh, who who gives a shit or, or or lives it. So there's a lot that we need to do there to to re to take that story back from people who hate us. From all of us, we need to take that story back. First, telling our own is important, and secondly, talking about you know what, what like it's, instead of reacting, we need to say, well, here's our story. Here's our sentence about where we need to what we need to do, because the police, what the police are doing, they just well, we're just going to bust this, bust this guy, bust that guy, and seize these. We need to talk about what the solutions are. Like, instead of saying because when we put, we're on the defense, when we're saying, oh, that's ridiculous. What do you mean forced treatment? We need to start saying. Instead of saying no to all of this pressure, we need to start building the yes. And that's the sense of, that's what framing is about, is finding a way to connect with the broader public and decision makers with, with what the yes is and, find, and getting there together. Like we, don't, we might not know it right away, but that's why we have to have that conversation and it needs to be directed by us, not by, not by our reactions to people like to this, horrid, this horribleness and by, you know, and, and by trying to fight against bad, bad proposals. We need to start putting our own out there that reflect our needs and the sense and the sense and the justice that we require. So that's so that's one that's one way to think about it. I mean, the other the example that I was always using is, is say like you know if you if you if you walk into a room and say okay look don't think about the elephant. Well, all you can think about is the elephant, right? All that's all you think that's all you got in your head. You gotta you've gotta think about like re, like very carefully structure the way that we're talking like that. To make give people a sense of what we what we mean, like for example, instead of saying you know instead of saying like back at the beginning opioid crisis, you know which which, makes, which doesn't actually you know convey anything, and it sets up this kind of evil drug thing, evil bad drug that's you know no we don't it's, let's talk about the unregulated drug supply, the unregulated drug supply, and that's the unregulated uh, drug the toxicity deaths. Let's talk about what the, so now we've got. The solution is in the is in how we describe it. I mean, we should regulate. So that's it's that that sort of thing because that it's a conversation that constantly has been slipping away from us, and we're, we're always on the we're always in this defensive posture, like reacting to terrible things. So we, we need to find a way to get to the point where we can actually talk about yes. And I know we can do that. It takes time, but we can. I think too, if I can just piggyback off of that, I think that when governments and other people in power describe the unregulated drug poisoning massacre, which is a phrase coined by Karen, by the way, uh, they often describe it as a crisis of stigma. 
uh, and that and that more more awareness will solve the problem. Uh, and and so I was doing yes. a little bit of digging, and there's a study from 2018 from Health Canada that showed that, and again, this is in 2018, over 70% of Canadians were confident they understood the risk of fentanyl uh, in the drug supply. Uh, the actual phrasing was something like greater than 70% understand the dangers of fentanyl. It was some really low-level research happening that probably cost a million dollars or more to complete. But it's actually never been about awareness or stigma, which are actually outputs of the real problem. Uh, we're talking about cr criminalization, prohibition, racism, the lack of regulated drugs. Uh, poverty. And those are what yeah. those poverty. Those are what drive the unregulated drugs. And when you understand that misframing happenings, uh, it's yeah. it's intentional and and it's a choice. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. It's framed that way so that you can have the highest perception of doing something while actually investing the fewest amount of resources to do it. Uh, yeah. This misframing happened with safe supply, with prescribed, or prescribed safe mm -hmm. supply. We're wrapped up eternally in a shouting match with each other. That's not safe supply. This is safe supply. You can't be on safe supply if it's prescribed. Safe supply is oh, an it's oat. Just, yeah. it's We're just, actually exactly. talking. Yes. Yeah, we're actually talking about regulated drug access. And what that is, is unique to the person who's seeking it. How they get it is unique to their needs. What they do with it is unique to their context and situation. Uh, and this debate is is a distraction. Huge distraction. We are so bad at that. We are like always with distraction. It's just, it just, uh, and debates. You know, this whole thing of sucking people in to these endless, pointless back and forth. If you, and the sign of that is always the binary, right? Oh, the whole thing. Treatment versus harm reduction. No, that is a false binary. And the fact, if you take it back, again, take a step back, um, treatment doesn't address the supply. Got to go. That's it. And, and that's because that's what we're trying to address. Identify the problem, and then you don't, you just brush all this distraction away. Because that's what, the, that, that, those, are, those are tactics to delay, and that's essentially what, what, what we mean by, by gatekeeping. Right. That's where the gate is. That's the gate right there. Are these are these debates that go on endlessly, which is a specialty. Indeed, this is culture war stuff. This is the stuff. This is, this is the stuff that's classic to the, the conservative, the conservative like the the right. You know, wrapping people up in this with false with false uh, false equivalencies and uh, and the rest. You've Got to be able to spot those things and 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 preempt them and and not allow that distraction to occur. We're very very. Everyone wants to be able to get in there and scrap it out, but they're not the fight we are in. Looks like Jennifer raised her hand. Um, Jennifer, if you want to say something, that's fine, or we can wait till the question period, but don't want to lose your thought. Too. Well, I say go for it. Go for it. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought we were kind of in a question time. I don't want to we interrupt sure. the flow here. No. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for this amazing discussion. I'm wondering if you can tell us, like, um, jumping off from some of the last points that were made, like we're saying that when there's discussions about policymakers saying, okay, we want to do safe supply, I think my understanding is that within the harm reduction community, there's different lenses on what quote unquote safe supply looks like. So what are your thoughts on how we can manage like those internal debates, if you will, um, but at the same time, try and move forward doing the most good that we can. Um, so like, are we gonna come to consensus, do you think? Or what might I, that look like? I have a, I tend to think that there's, I mean, I think it, for example, something like safe supply or exact, or even like overdose prevention is going to look different in different contexts. I mean, what we, what does, what happens in Vancouver? Is it going to be what happens in Nelson? Is it going to be what happens here? Or what will happen in two years from now? I mean, I tend to, I wrote, I made a, um, a, a an alignment chart, like a D and D alignment chart. It's, you know, a chaotic good all the way, you know, all the way to, uh, to, to, to um, uh, neutral evil or whatever it is. Anyways, it was about, and it's about, this is a variety. We need to have all these options. The solution is always going to be choices and they need to be flexible. Like there's no, just because someone, if someone is getting a, say, say for example, they're getting a, um, they're getting something, they're, they're picking up from a pharmacy, but then like two years later, they, they've got something, something else is going on. Like this, the idea of regulation too, is uh, they, when, when, uh, when, when BC uh, ended alcohol prohibition, 
it was very different in 1921 than what it looked like in 1926. They were getting it wrong. They tried this. Oh, this was working. Let's have a bar. Let's do this. Let's, let's have separate entrances for men and women. Let's do this instead. Let's, they had the first liquor store in uh, the government, the first BCLC liquor store in Vancouver looked like a fortress. Like it was like literally with, with, with terror. Like it was, it was, I was shocked. It was amazing. But it looked like a fortress with a gate and the whole thing, like, you know, uh, cat, like, what are those things called? Turrets, turrets around it. It was ridiculous. But that's, but that's because they were, oh, we, we can't let the kids near this stuff or let them see it. Like it was the same kind of mentality. Like these things will change and evolve. And this idea that we've got to find this perfect thing is, is, a, is again, it's a, it's a red herring. There isn't going to be one because it's all going to be, it, it has to be about the only necessary thing. I think it's, it's got to be about choices and flexibility. And, and the person who makes those choices has got to be the person who's using. Like whether it's, I mean, whether we're talking about commercial or retail or, or prescribed or clinic or, or what have you, or vending, I don't care. It's got to be, it's still got to be, there's got to be some flexibility there because people's use changes. And we don't, we cannot predict, and I don't think we should necessarily, but we but predict how how things are going to change when when you have access you're not in non criminalized access because it's like one of the biggest things I've noticed here at least is that when people get back what nobody thinks about what nobody expects it's like oh I, I have all this time now right I don't have to run around looking like find my money and this and that and the other thing I have all this time to live my life that's when things start changing in whatever way they are, they do like let's not Let's not, in fact, let's, let's not be prescriptive with the prescriptions, right? Let's just, we have to be recognizing that there's going to be, people's lives are going to change. And that's, I don't want to think about, I don't like to think about, well, we save lives. Actually, it's about changing lives because you, you don't actually, if you're not on the on the grind all the time, maybe, you, maybe you're not so, you know, you're, 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 your use becomes more more stable when, you're, when your material conditions improve. And that's something that we don't, I mean, it's a, again, drug use is complicated, all drug use, but it's, it's, it does, it is about the, it is reflective and about a consequence of the changes in someone's life. And uh, so we need to have that kind of flexibility. I wish we, I mean, it would be great if we could actually recognize that as a framework and say, we've got to find uh, equitable access for people. We've got to make sure these things are accessible to everyone. We've got to make sure that there is no funding, you know, there's no huge funding inequity. And that these are, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Like we should really keep in mind that our goal has to be justice, uh, in, 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 and not just for the, not for the, and, you know, and for the, um, and, and it's social justice. Like this is actually safe supply is a public good, not just an individual need, but a public good as well. And I think too, just to that effect, and not even being specific about safe supply, but you will run into competing priorities, and you will run into, um, you know, like a lot of, uh, you know, need for one way to be the only way. And truthfully, when you run into those kind of narratives, my response is always like, the answer is options. And understanding that everybody is is unique and has unique needs and unique contexts that bring them to this situation, and when in doubt, like don't don't listen to someone who's going to come here and say this is the only way that we're going to be able to do this. Uh, go go back to people who use drugs and ask them what they want, and and always reground yourself in the actual people who are going to be impacted by this policy. Uh, then you can at least yeah. find ways to kind of hold true and, and not experience that moral drift. And to add to that one thing, the idea like the, the, low, the low barrier, I think is something oh, uh -oh. low barrier doesn't actually exist, right? Because we all have different kinds of, 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 uh, of barriers and, 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 um, and, and, you know, for different people, what barrier for one person might be no, not even noticeable for others. Something that is a barrier to me, isn't a barrier to somebody else, but it's um, there's actually just about access. It's actually more about access and having options again and finding ways to, um, you know, again, like you said, choices, options. Like that's the thing. If you because when when you're in the situation right now using using drugs, let's let's, let's recognize this using unknown substances, putting unknown substances in your body. You're doing that because you have no choices. So let's create choices, and that's. That's when things sort of can, you know, then you might, make, then you have a chance to make them. You know, this, what, what we're dealing with right now is represents having no choices at all. 
Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and I will reflect on these for your responses for quite some time. I think I find that like in my practice, um, I can never kind of like trying to be a policy advocate. I can never make everybody happy. And then, you know, some people are upset that I settle for anything less than absolutely perfect. But on another hand, it's like, well, if we can get this through the door, then maybe we can open the door right. by you building relationships for more discussions. And yeah. And so yeah. I kind of struggle with that, that because I know that government loves it when we fight amongst ourselves because then we're not busy advocating at them. <laughs> but, you know, it, anyway, I really appreciate your thoughts on this. Okay. The thing, yeah, but it's really important to jam the door open right i mean that's the thing these things are a process it's always there is always a process and i mean i think it's about you know finding let's there are steps that are that are necessary to get there right oops oops okay that, that oh shit. yes all good uh -oh. um no, I, oh. there so I think a lot of these questions we've already touched on, just the one specifically around medicalization. Why is medicalization a bad thing? Is it? And is there a balance or where is the balance? It's a big topic to, to discuss. We'll, we'll probably go over time a bit. Um, yeah, but take it away. I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, co-optation, uh, is appropriation for a new purpose and we often see movements co-opted because their core values and principles become compromised to satisfy some other competing priority like we've talked about but medical co-optation mm -hmm. of harm reduction has happened because of a category error uh yes. it's a misframe again we're in a people talking about this being a crisis of addiction that's that's a common one right and the mantra is that law enforcement it, you know we we then found a really palatable argument by saying law enforcement isn't the answer it's a health issue and we understood right. that there were some short gains in that messaging and that it appealed to a lot of people but it also set us down a path of assuming that everybody who uses drugs and everybody who's had an overdose has a disorder or has a disease. And this becomes the basis for paternalism, the barriers that we see from addiction medicine, gatekeeping for safe supply, even politicians talking about involuntary treatment and hospitalization. It fuels a narrative that people don't actually have the right to make decisions about themselves because they're not making sound decisions for themselves. Right. And so therein lies where medicalization becomes, becomes harmful. Uh, and it isn't necessarily that uh, you know, nurses or doctors can't work in harm reduction or can't adopt a harm reduction philosophy. It's that medicalization is only a bad thing when it disempowers the people who are accessing the services, which unfortunately it does a lot still. Uh, it's not about medicine and harm reduction not being compatible. It's about power dynamics and how power is taken from people who use drugs when they have to navigate healthcare systems. It's a phrase that I a phrase that I like is clinical imperialism, right? Where it's like where there's actually the dom the, the there's a that's the medical the whole medical framing is becomes that becomes uh the becomes like defines what's what's happening and that's you know again well that's obviously not true it was well, not obviously not true but it becomes this uh you know like we see often it's like well only let's ask these doctors how to how to how to address this whole situation and it's like well um they don't actually it's, maybe it's not medical per se. I mean, we, we see this evolution, right? Where it's like, is it a criminal issue? No, 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 it's not. Addiction is not a criminal issue. Well, it's actually not addiction. Well, okay, well, medical, it's substance use disorder. That's a health issue. Okay, well, now we, you know, thousands of, uh, of, of, of overdose deaths. That's a public health issue. Um, and well, actually, you know, what I've been thinking, it's, it's actually an economic issue. This is about a marketplace. This is about poverty. This is about you know, uh, this is about inequality in a bigger fundamental way. And that, and in, in some sense, those are all reframings. And that gives you a chance to see, well, how are we going to actually solve it? You know, police do policing to solve it. Doctors do medicine to solve it, right? Uh, and uh, so, we, so we move along and, we, you know, public health people do, do public health interventions to solve it. And, you know, it's in effect, a public health intervention would have been replaced the supply. But now if we say economic, then it's like, oh well, yeah, let's talk about inequality and economic justice. 
but it's also, but it's, you know, there's much more than that too, because if you think about, if I can throw this in too, if you could throw in like decriminalization, that's not about, that's actually see, what we have right now. This, this idea that we have a decrim just being a threshold of possession is it actually about, that's actually a policing frame, right? But it's, that's decriminalization. We need to redefine that and reframe it as about the process of people becoming citizens, um, you know, in the, in, in becoming full citizens, um, because that's what, that's what that's about. If you think about the historical parallels, it's about, it's about homosexuality becoming decriminalized in 1968 or whatever it was, and then a process of becoming members of society and citizens, which isn't instant. It is not about a threshold. Uh, sorry. It's a, it's about, it's about an expansive vision of be, of changing, changing, actually changing society by becoming part of it. Which is why I like to say decriminalize yourself. It's about it's about way more than that. It's about entering. It's about breaking down breaking down stigma and discrimination by entering the main entering the public, the big world, and changing it that way. So we need that, and that goes into what I think about organizing at this point. We need to organize horizontally rather than simply as people who are concerned about people. Who no, we're all concerned because this is all of us, and this is part of the process that we must uh, uh, we must. Um, you know, it, um, yeah. Wait, well, I just lost all my words. The part of the part, part of the process that we that we must endeavor to to, to work through. Um, it's it's about it's bigger than us. It is bigger than us, and uh, we, we it's we can't keep uh, we can't we can't silo ourselves off from that. Um, but the and I, the one more thing about the whole criminal medical thing, if there was, if if you're given a binary opposite, right? Criminal medical uh, treatment harm reduction. Those are always wrong. There's always more than two choices. That's a good sign to see that there's that you're being drawn into an argument that isn't real. We always have more than two choices. Great. Uh, we're gonna move now into uh, strategies oh. for nurses and and get ready to close up and see if there's any questions. Uh, so these strategies include. Uh, understanding the intersections of your nursing ethics and the principles of harm reduction, uh, learn how to adopt a harm reduction approach to everything that you do. Uh, these are all strategies that you can you can do right now. And they're not things, they're not big fish things. They're about understanding the nuances. And another one is that language is power. Uh, be aware of the appropriateness and safety of language, but also understand that there is intention behind the choice of language that people use. When we talk about the illicit versus illegal versus unregulated drug supply, there's one choice out of those three that actually correctly frames the source of the issue, the lack of regulation. The other two actually denote some, some, some bit of you're doing something wrong. Uh, and that was, that's what leads to moralizing people who, who are experiencing drug poisoning events. They're also imprecise. They're just imprecise, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, framing, we talked about framing, understanding the topic at hand, don't lose sight of the real issues, don't be distracted by stigma and awareness, understand that those are tools of the oppressor. Uh, power, understand the power and privilege you have and when it's helpful to use and also understand that there are many intersecting power dynamics at hand. Mm -hmm. Listen to people with lived and living experience, uh, don't speak for, make space for, pay them for their expertise in consultation. Uh, and these are, you know, things that I'm always still just learning, but uh, learn, but learn and be comfortable. Say that yeah. again, Karen? I was gonna say collaborate actively, right? Like bounce ideas around. This is like, that's what the word, that's what it's about. If you don't, you're, you're it's like, um, that's where the, that's where, you know, it's a really creative effort here where we're actually working, we actually working together where, where, where we can see that we're, contributing different things. It's actually a collaborative project. That, it's a collaborative pro politics, if you like. And that takes a lot of trust and that breaks power down between all of us. And it's really important to do that too. Absolutely. I think that falls under the, the organized category. Yeah. Uh, oh. And the last one, which is a thing from, from my personal learning and experience yeah. is discomfort. Uh, learn to sit with discomfort and uh, of being wrong and be okay with that and be wrong every single day and be willing to learn uh, because there's too much ego in, in drug policy and harm reduction and there's not oh, enough room for all of the yeah. ego. It's so hierarchical, all of this, it's nonsense. You gotta let that go. Jeez, yeah. 
And then just a couple of suggested readings for you. I always suggest people read everything Zoe Dodd touches. Uh, the Revolution <laughs> Will Not Be Funded uh, is a great book that is relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, Karen mm -hmm. Ward herself is the author of Name Change, Frame Change, uh, Late to the oh, Apocalypse. Wow. And I recommend you read that. Uh, it's it's. I wish we had a little bit more time because I was going to prompt Karen to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then a recent article about no force treatment, David E.B. from the HRNA, uh, as an example of where you might find yourself when you need to advocate, always think about the HRNA and joining up with us because there's strength in numbers. <laughs>